We have come to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Now you'll remember Romans chapter 12 uh, is the exhortation to live a sacrificed life being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we talked about what all that, what all that means and uh, how the renewed mind is a saved mind, a mind that sees everything through the eyes of someone who has been redeemed, who has been rescued, who recognizes our own fallibility, our own brokenness and failedness, but the grace and love of Jesus Christ that has been poured into us, that has healed us. And we now have uh, the opportunity to share that with others. And we want to see through Christ's eyes. And so the rest of Romans chapter 12 goes on to describe what that looks like, how we can live a sacrificed life. We do so by loving our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And we do that by loving those who are outside of the body of Christ. And uh, we come to chapter 13, and we continue with this theme of living a sacrificed life. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 13 of the book of Romans, let every person be sub subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment, and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So the person who resists such authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers cause no fear for good conduct, but for bad. Do you desire not to fear authority? Do good, and you will receive its commendation, because it is God's servant for your well-being. But be afraid if you do wrong, because government does not bear the sword for nothing. It is God's servant to administer punishment on the person who does wrong. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath of the authorities, but also because of your conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants devoted to governing. Pay everyone what is owed, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and if there's any other commandment, are summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this because we know the time, that it is already the hour for us to awake from sleep, for our salvation is now nearer than when we became believers. The night has advanced toward dawn. The day is near. So then we must lay aside the works of darkness, put on the weapons of light. Let us live decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in discord and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. Father, we're so grateful that you have laid us a pattern of good works. And Father, we recognize that we don't work to earn our salvation, but Father, we, we serve in order to represent you well. So Father, give us hearts of humility. Give us, uh, give us a, a guide of love, and may we truly represent you. May we put on Christ every single day. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, Paul tells us here in chapter 13 to owe no man anything. Now, does that mean that uh, uh, we shouldn't borrow money? Well, you know, uh, debt is uh, a, a dangerous thing. Debt can lead you into bad situations. And we know the Bible tells us the borrower is, the borrower is slave to the lender. So does that mean that the Bible... Uh, <laughs> discourages us from getting a mortgage to buy a house? or No, that's not what it's talking about at all. And this, uh, this verse really doesn't have anything to do with commercial debt. 
Uh, I would never encourage anyone to go into debt. Uh, it is unwise and can lead to difficulty. But that's not what this chapter is talking about. This chapter is talking about uh, owing, not not taking on debt, but uh, the fact that we have a, uh, a responsibility, that we have uh, obligations that must be met. And so he begins... And so he begins in verse 1 with the big one, the most difficulty. We have an obligation to the government. And, you know, we may not like our current government, but it's better than Nero. <laughs> Who was the government when Paul wrote this? Do you remember? He is writing to the church in Rome. Now, Paul was a Roman citizen. Everywhere he traveled was within the Roman Empire. However, uh, you know, Nero Caesar was uh, living in Rome. He was, he, he was uh, in control of the city of Rome directly. You know, he may have governors and proconsuls and, and others out in the, the provinces, but he is writing to the seat of government in Rome. And Nero was a madman. Nero was absolutely crazy. Nero started out well, and he did some really good things, but uh, his paranoia and his power uh, drove him mad. And he had uh, his wife murdered. Uh, he, he was uh, he said that uh, Nero's the one that uh, burned down Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. Nero was bad uh, in, in every respect as a ruler, but especially towards the Christians. I mean, Nero is the emperor who is going to have Paul beheaded. Nero is the emperor who Paul appeals to, he appears before, apparently Nero pardons him or, or releases him, and then has him rearrested and has him beheaded. And this is the government that Paul says to be subject to. That's interesting. This reminds me of Philippi, when Paul and Silas were in the jail there. They were in the jail unjustly. They had been arrested without any sort of cause. They had had no trial. There was no, they were, they were beaten and punished and, and tortured in the stocks with absolutely no legal justification whatsoever. And what happened at midnight? The earthquake, the jail opened up, their stocks fell off, and what did they do? They stayed there. And because they stayed within the jail, they didn't run away they were able to be a witness to the Philippian jailer. And they were able to lead him and his entire household to the Lord. And then the next day, the leaders of the city send a message to say, okay, send them away. And Paul replies, you violated my rights. I am a Roman citizen, and you beat me without a trial, you beat me without cause, and you had me imprisoned, and now you're going to send me away privately? I don't think so. You come down here to the jail and you give me a public apology and you give me a parade. I want everyone to see that I was treated unjustly. Was Paul being uh, arrogant or? No, he was living within the law. He was being subject to the law. Just because a ruler says something doesn't make it so. You hear in, uh, in, in, in Paul's time, the, the Roman law was the highest law of the land. It was the, the, the controlling factor. And the fact that he was a Roman citizen gave him special rights and privileges. And he held those who violated his rights to account. He had them uh, apologize. And he had them lead him out. Uh, publicly so that everyone would know that he had been unjustly arrested. Why did he do this? He did this for the protection of the Philippian church so that after he left, the government wouldn't begin to, or the, the people wouldn't feel free to attack the, the new believers. 
they would have a little bit of humility and, and stay within the bounds of the law. But when the jail flew open, he didn't run away. He was subject to the law. He obeyed it. And when Nero had him executed, he didn't flee. He didn't try to escape. He didn't. Uh, he stayed. He, he he accepted the punishment of the government, even though it was unjust. You know, nowadays we like to talk a lot about our rights, don't we? And the fact is that the highest law of our land, the highest authority, is not the president, it's not the governor, it's not the Congress, it is the Constitution. And we owe our allegiance to the Constitution. And so when our leaders violate the Constitution, we, like Paul, should hold them to account. And we should demand that they, uh, they stay within their bounds, that they also obey the law. But we are obedient to the Constitution, to our government. He says, be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Because there is no authority except by God's appointment. This is stated over and over and over in the Old Testament. Do you remember what God said to Pharaoh when Moses went and, and told him to let my people go? And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? God said, I put you in this place just so I could show my glory. And Pharaoh was an unjust and wicked leader. And God had established him as an unjust and wicked leader. Why? So that he could gloriously defeat him and display his power over Egypt and the gods of Egypt. We don't know why God allows unjust and wicked leaders to arise, but God does. And he puts them in place. He establishes them. Do you remember uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon? Here's a man who was a wicked leader. Here is a man who was a uh, violent and bloodthirsty and uh, and came to know the Lord, I believe. But after years and years and years of uh, uh, being kicked in the face for his disobedience, um, God called him to defeat Israel, his people. We don't know why God does what he does, but he does it. He chooses it. We look at Saul, King Saul. King Saul was a wicked leader. King Saul sought to kill David, and twice David had Saul's life in his hands. And what did David say? I will not raise my hand to God's anointed. Now we could have said, well, God removed his anointing from Saul when Samuel told him God's ripping the kingdom away from you. He's fair game. That's not what David said. David went out to the mountains. He lived the life of an outlaw. He, 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 uh, he was on the run for years, waiting patiently for God to work it out. He was obedient to the authorities that, that be. And then the, the greatest illustration, I think, is uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now, go home and look up Cyrus, the king of Persia. He was uh, a trickster. He was a, a, a violent man. I mean, the Persians invented crucifixion. Uh, they were bloody people. And God said, calls him Cyrus, my shepherd. And Cyrus is the only Gentile in the whole Bible that, that God uses the title Messiah for. Cyrus, my anointed one. Was Cyrus a believer? No, he was not a believer. But he had been established and put in place for God to use him. So we don't know why we have the leadership we have. We certain, I certainly didn't vote for them. But, but God established them. He has put them in place. And therefore, we have a responsibility to be subject to the governing authorities. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't exercise our right of petition, that we don't vote otherwise every opportunity we get. But in the meantime, we are not in a state of rebellion. Now, you look at the church in Rome, and the previous Caesar had exiled 
you know, the Jewish members of the church out of the city. Uh, they had great reason to resent the Roman government. And uh, that may be why Paul's writing this. Some of them may have said, well, I'm not paying them my taxes. <laughs> you say, no, no, pay your taxes. Be subject to the governing authorities. Now, the purpose of human government is to establish right and wrong. Uh, our government is not the first to fail at that. We see throughout history governments that have uh, uh, inverted right and wrong. Uh, we can all think of uh, governments within our lifetime that, thank God, no longer exist, but that, uh, that inverted right and wrong and, and oppressed their people and were horrible. And yet, uh, the purpose of government has been instituted by God in order to establish right from wrong. Governments that do not do this, God will take care of. Leave, them in, leave it in his hands. He can handle it. Uh, but that is the purpose. So if you want to, uh, in general, if you want to live a good life, if you want to live free of trouble, uh, just obey the law. You know, wear your seatbelt, don't, uh, don't speed, don't do things that uh, are against the law, and you'll be fine. Now this is Paul writing this, who uh, just a few years later is going to be arrested and imprisoned and uh, have his head cut off for preaching the gospel. But the principle is that the government is to reward the good and judge the bad. So we owe our government, we have an obligation to our government for obedience. Secondly, we have an obligation to our government to pay our taxes. Uh, this makes me very upset. When people are uh, filling out applications at my work, they'll get to the... Uh, They'll get to the uh, income section, and it says net income. They'll say, what does net mean? I said, net is what you bring home. Gross is how you feel when you see what the government takes. Um, it's, it, 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 it's just uh, so infuriating when we see uh, what our taxes are being used for. I have no problem contributing to the society in which I live. I have no problem supporting, uh, you know, our military and fire and, and police and roads, and, but we watch our money being wasted so horribly, and it's disgusting, but uh, it's no worse than what was going on in Rome. We have an obligation to pay our taxes, and once, the, once it's paid, then it's out of our hands. They will answer to God how to use it. But we have an obligation to pay our taxes. We have no right to uh, to cheat or to hide our income or to avoid it, uh, we must pay our taxes. And we must pay any other sort of revenue, such as uh, some translations translate that customs, uh, import, act, in, import and export tariffs and customs. In other words, don't be a smuggler. <laughs> Don't try to sneak things in and avoid the import duties. You have an obligation to pay those. And so we pay our taxes. He says uh, to pay the taxes. He says, uh, verse 7, pay everyone what is owed, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due. We may not respect the person, but we must respect the office. This goes from uh, dog catcher all the way up to President of the United States. If they represent our government, we may not respect the person, but we must respect the office uh, because they represent our government. They represent the authority that God has established and honor to whom honor is due. And tomorrow we will pay honor to those who have given their lives in service of their country. Now, we may not agree with the wars they fought in. We may feel they were a waste of, uh, of life and resources. We may feel like they were foolish. We may think that they were exactly what was necessary, and, and we're all for it. It doesn't matter what your opinion of the war is. The warriors deserve to be honored. Those who sacrificed themselves, those who offered themselves 
to secure uh, our freedoms and to serve in our place deserve honor. And so we will honor them. That's what we, that's the obligation we owe to the government. And so we don't want to owe anything. We don't want to fail in our obligations to the government. We look at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4 through 7. We see what uh, Jeremiah writes to the Jews who had been carried away into captivity into Babylon. Now remember what these people had gone through. They had seen their entire city level, destroyed, their, their young men carried off into, in, into servitude, their lands laid waste, they were ripped out of their homes, they were carried away to another nation that spoke a different language and, and had different customs, the temple of God was destroyed. What did, what did Jeremiah write to these people who were in captivity, they were not allowed, they did not have freedom of movement, they could not return to their homes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to whom all, to all who were carried away uh, captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. We may know that this world is not our home. We're passing through. We may recognize that our citizenship is in heaven. We may realize that, uh, that this place uh, is enemy territory. But the fact is that God has placed us here just as God had placed these Jews in the city of Babylon. And just as he told them, build houses, become part of the community. Settle in, get to know your neighbors, build houses, have children, build families, raise gardens, pray for the peace of the city that you're in. Now, don't you think that at that point, most of the people were praying for the destruction of Babylon? I know I would have been. Lord, destroy this wicked city that destroyed my home. But God says, no, pray for the peace of the place that I have put you. Because then you will have peace. If Babylon had been destroyed, what would these people have had? God wasn't going to let them go home for 70 years. We don't know when he's coming for us. But we have a responsibility to be good citizens of the place that he has put us. And to, to settle in, to have families, to, to build lives, to serve God well, wherever he has put us, so that we can bring peace to our community. And then he continues on, don't owe anything to your government, and don't owe anything to your neighbor. He goes from the overarching government down to the community you live in. And that is often a very different thing, isn't it? Uh, the government very rarely actually represents the people. And we need to not just have allegiance to our Constitution, we need to have a concern for those who live um, uh, around us, those whom we live among. We need to have a concern and a care for those that we interact with every day, the people uh, we do business with, the, the, the people who, who share our street, the people that uh, we interact with in our, our daily lives, our neighbors. Verse 8, owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. It's easy to stay within the bounds of the law. Okay, I can obey the law, but then be a rotten neighbor, isn't it? We've all had those rotten neighbors. A Christian should never be that. A Christian should be the one in the community who is known for uh, not taking 
from everyone, but giving. Not demanding, but caring. Not seeking, but sharing. We should be the ones that are known for love. That is the fulfillment of the law. You're not going to commit adultery with the wife of someone that you love. How could you do that? And if you love your wife, you're not, or if you love your husband, you're not going to commit adultery. That's a violation of love. You're not going to kill someone you love. These are all things you do if you are wrapped up in yourself, like the world teaches us to be. But if you're not looking out for yourself, if you're looking out for those around you, those that God has placed in your family and in your community, then you are going to not do these things. You're going to do the opposite of it. You're going to be faithful in your relationships. You're going to be uh, life-giving and not life-taking. You're going to be sharing instead of stealing. You're going to be uh, rejoicing with others instead of envying them. You're going to care for your neighbor. We have uh, uh, an obligation to love our community, to love our neighbor. Not only do we have an obligation to love our neighbor, we have an obligation to light our neighbor. Verse 11, and do this because we know the time that is already the hour for us to wake from sleep. That it is already the hour for us to awake from sleep, for our salvation is now nearer than when we became believers. The night is advanced the, uh, toward the dawn, the day is near. So then we must lay aside the works of darkness and put on the weapons of light. We are in a battle, but our battle is not with our neighbors. Our battle is with the one who wants to blind our neighbors, with the enemy who wants to, to darken our neighbors and draw them away from God. We know that the day is approaching. What day is he talking about? The revelation of the Son, the Son of God, when He returns in His glory and establishes His kingdom, when He shines uh, his, his light forth on this earth and all darkness is banished, that day is coming. And so we must be prepared so that we can draw our neighbors into the light with us so that when He does return, He will not return in judgment on them, but in rejoicing to receive them to himself along with us as his bride. We know that there, we, we don't know when it's going to happen, but there is going to be a trumpet sound. There is going to be a, a mighty shout, and the dead in Christ are going to rise up, and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up into the air with him in, uh, in, for eternity, to spend eternity with him. And that is going to set off seven years of judgment. After those seven years of judgment, he will return, and we will return with him. And he will bring to this earth light as, the, as this earth has never received before. But we need to put on our weapons of light and fight the darkness now so that we can bring as many as possible with us in that glorious resurrection day when we are all caught up together. I don't want my friends and my neighbors to go through the period of judgment. I don't, I especially don't want my friends and my neighbors and my loved ones to die and spend eternity in outer darkness away from God. And so I need to stop living like the world. I need to stop having the same priorities as the world. I need to stop... Uh, feeding my flesh, I need to stop living in sensuality and discord. Discord is out of, uh, out of uh, harmony with those around me. Uh, being, being a difficult person and jealousy, uh, seeking my, my own good rather than the, the good of those around me. To live decently as in the daytime, not caught up in the, the carousing or the partying or, or drunkenness or allowing other things to have control of us, not in sexual immorality, 
or sensuality, not in uh, filling the desires of the flesh, whether sexual or or uh, uh, laziness or food or, or other sensual things. We need to stop living in the flesh. And he even says to make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. Have you ever been on a diet? Don't you hate walking by a bakery when you're on a diet? And smelling that? And, and your mouth starts to water when you know you can't have it. So we are on a healthy spiritual diet of the Word of God and the fellowship with His people, of uh, good godly thoughts and intentions and purpose. Uh, why would we feed? Why would we feed our flesh with the the smells of the world, and then have to fight those desires off? Make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. Stay away from things that draw you into temptation. Why? Because we don't have time for it. The dawn is coming. We have got to fight the darkness now. Verse 14, instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to wrap ourselves up in Christ like a blanket. You ever had a chilly evening and you wrap the blanket around you and you got it as tight as possible and as close as possible so that uh, it kept the cold out? We wrap ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all that sensual stuff is outside. And we are snuggled in Him. And our, our world is focused on Him. Owe no man anything except to love one another. Meet your obligations to the government and meet your obligations to your community. Father, we are so thankful that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, has delivered us from the power of sin, has rescued us from the penalty of sin, and has uh, translated us into the kingdom of light. And Father, though we are still dwelling in this dark city, we know that we are the soldiers of light here. Father, may our weapons of warfare be love and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.